Uh, first off, Andy, thank you for joining me. Very, very happy. Well, um, thanks, thanks for the invite. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm um, you. You. We're not going. In fact, this is in, in classic HR podcast style. We're not going to go down even the line we talked about two seconds ago. <laughs> we'll come on. We'll come on. How much charities get pay, charity CEOs get paid in a minute? Uh, explain what you do, please. So I'm a clinical hypnotherapist and mm-hmm. psychotherapist. Um, and that's a kind of evolution of my my passions over over many years. I spent 22 years in the corporate game in a completely different environment uh, in the motor industry. And I uh, finished up that career running 17 million pound divisions in 1.3 billion and 500 million pound companies. D- doing what? what uh, running them? Corporate sales. So ah. running corporate teams, corporate sales teams, reporting in, um, selling business to business in, in that environment, in that arena. Um and I dropped out of that 2008 when the banking crisis happened. Crisis happened, but I also collapsed through stress during that journey. So uh, I guess where I am here today is as a result of that journey I took. When you say collapsed, as in just life collapsed? Uh, no, I, collapsed. I was stood in the shower one morning having a shower, and uh, my wife came through the ensuite door and said, "What do you think about this outfit I'm wearing?" As they do, <laughs> Dan- yeah. dangerous question. Yeah, goodness <laughs> me. And I said, "Oh, it looks great." She said, "Well, I've got another one. I think I'll try that." So she went out. I'd, I'd been driving quite a bit, had a lot of back pain, so I was just taking the power of the shower on the lower part of my back. And as she came through the second time, I kind of took my hands off my knees and I kind of stood up. And she said, you know, you just, you just rolled, your eyes rolled into the back of your head. You came out of the shower like you'd been felled by a lumberjack's axe. As soon as you hit the ground, you were fitting. Head was going off the floor, legs going, arms going. You were in a full-on fit. And, uh, yeah, scary. Absolutely scary. I mean, I, you know, bruised all the side of my arms. I went out through the door and hit the floor with my face. So my l- linoleum burned along the face. And, um... When I come out of it, you know, hot and cold sweats, no idea what happened. All I could remember was looking at the basin, the base of the shower thing, or the base of the sink, <clears> sorry, <throat> thinking, you know, what am I doing looking at the sink from this angle? I should be standing up in the shower. I need to get up. I need to get up. I need to get up. That was a kind of fitting action. So I'm going in my head. I need to get up. So I called the doctors, etc. Long story short, 24 hours of sleep deprivation in a hospital bed for four hours of electrodes all over me. And they said, Andy, you know, there's nothing wrong with your brain that we can see that could have caused that. Um, Physiologically. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's nothing coming up on traces that indicate you haven't had a stroke. There's nothing we can see. Um, you're probably a stone overweight. Uh, you know, your uh, blood pressure is a little bit high, but not, not anything to be concerned about. And I'll never forget the consultant's words to you. He said, Andy, take this as a very, very big alarm call. This could have been a heart attack or a stroke. And only a third of people get away from a stroke with no ill effects. You know, he said, you must have been under an immense amount of stress. And I don't know how you've been managing that stress, but you need to reflect on what you were doing because it clearly hasn't worked. And you need to moderate and modify what you are doing. And, you know, when I look back on it, Hugh, he's probably right. You know, I used to drive home and my de-stressor was cooking. I love cooking. So I'd phone my wife and say, you know, she'd probably fed the kids by that time. And I'd say, well, have you eaten? No. Well, I'll stop at the supermarket, get something and I'll, I'll rustle us up something to eat. But of course, I'd buy a bottle of red wine or a bottle of rosé or whatever. And I'd open a bottle of red wine, have a glass while I was preparing dinner. Glass while we ate it. But I can guarantee you by twelve, well, by 10 o'clock, that bottle was finished. Mm. You know, you're doing that every night of the week. And that's your de-stressor. You wake up a little bit tired in the morning. You've got a bit of a fuzzy head. And then you're back into a fully stressful situation. It's yeah. depressant as well, isn't it? Oh, yeah, well. it's, about, it's self-medication. You know, I was medicating. For all intents and purposes, it was self-medication. It allowed me to come off that kind of elevated plane of attention and focus and, and drop down into a kind of relaxed, chill-out mode, you know? Mm. But you do that for 18 months, you know, plus a couple of weekends where you've got barbecues and pub lunches and a few beers with the mates, and it soon adds up. Certainly with no, al- with no exercise, because I wasn't exercising. I was full on, mm-hmm. you know, um, and it takes its toll. And I think that was it for me. Mm. So a massive wake up call. Mm. The alcohol is an interesting one. I've seen it myself, uh, so personally, um, over the last couple of years. And it's sort of a still, still a, like a learning experience where I, I can, <coughs> I can now, you know, I think right now I can see, um, when, like you're saying, that relaxant, God, yeah, to de stress alcohol. But at the same time, I can also reflect on things where I know. Well, I, I know that, um, if, if I haven't had alcohol the day before, and it could be, like you say, it could be half a bottle of wine or whatever. Um, if I haven't had it the day before, no, I, I can put indecision, I can put indecision or poor decision down to, um, 
having drank the day before, or even a couple of days before on a big on a big bender. Yeah, yeah. And when I, you know, I'm going to say decision, bad decision. I mean, basic stuff, but you don't realize it at the time. It's that. Uh, so for me, it's um, a problem presents itself. Whatever that problem may be, personal, professional, and however big or small it may be, it's magnified. It becomes it's much bigger in my head if I've been drinking than if I hadn't. And if I've been drinking, the problem doesn't get addressed. It's yeah. left and it and it snowballs. And if I have been, and if I haven't been drinking, um, I'm not under that influence. And especially where it comes to a, that uh, habit of repeated drinking, like say, even a couple a couple of glasses of whatever a night. It's in your system all the time then. And if I haven't been drinking, pff, problem comes up, deal with it, no stress, done. Not an issue. You know, it's, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. like, I, like I, that's how I like to operate. You're locked on. <laughs> yeah, you're locked yeah. on cognitively, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. But it's, when the emotions come through, it's different. It's difficult to make a decision when there's emotions involved. Because mm-hmm. you've got to rationalise, well, what's the right decision to make here? You know, mm-hmm. I, I feel this way, but I think this way. And it's yeah. conflict. You can, when you, you've got yeah, internal you conflict. Can def- you st- you, from, that, from those experiences... Not that I've ever been an alcoholic, but I, I can see how easy it is to slip into alcoholism. Yeah. To not, cause it's, it's not easy to get out of that rut when you're regularly drinking because it becomes habit or whatever and you're just enjoying. Be- oh, God, sit down after the evening, I'll have a cup of glass of wine. Oh, it's nice. And it's habits, routine, it's enjoyable. Yeah. But the impact, you don't, you don't even notice the impact. It can be, and it's usually other people that notice it before we do. Yeah, exactly. exactly yeah. Um, you know, I saw it with my dad, Hugh. I mean, my dad was a career soldier, 22 years. He was originally 2-9 commando instructor in the early days. And he really struggled to resettle. You know, he, did, he, he just couldn't get the mindset of civilian life right. And he went into security work as they do. He, tend to, he found himself gravitating up to Aberdeen, working offshore in the insur- offshore industry. Um, but that habit of alcohol became his crutch, if you like. And I say, well, I work with clients and we're looking at, you know, changing um, mindsets to peak performance mindsets. And uh, I say, you know, the, the, the silky threads of repetition are too weak to be felt until the chains of habit appear to be too strong to be broken. Let me think about that. Say that again. So those little, <laughs> those little silky threads of repetition, a bit yep. like a spider's web, they're mm-hmm. so fine and silky you hardly notice them. But that repetition built and built and built becomes so strong as a chain you, can't, you feel you can't break it. Mm-hmm. And so the alcohol crutch becomes so strong that people can't, or they convince themselves, they can't stop drinking, they can't stop taking drugs, they can't stop smoking, they can't... You know, go to the dentist. I mean, as a clinical hypnotherapist, many times I actually have to unhypnotize people because <clears throat> they've hypnotized themselves to believe they can't do something mm-hmm. because that habit has, appears to be too strong. Mm. And it's very simple to break. So that's where I love simple. seeing that pit. Yeah. Simple, but not easy. <laughs> it's not necessarily easy. It's simple, but like anything else, it's a repetition of a different habit, isn't it? Because you just build a new habit that isn't like the old one. So um, when that habit no longer serves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Explain to me then, um, as I understand. No, I was going to say as, as I understand hypnotherapy, and then tell you as I understand it. Uh, you just explain it to me. Explain, explain. So if you're when you're trying to fix a problem, let's say uh, smoking. Let's take yeah. smoking for example. I, uh, I, I would be incorrect. I'm guessing to saying that he, um, hypnotherapy would work for everyone in terms of stopping smoking you can't just the, pe- the person has to want to quit they, they, they absolutely have to want to quit absolutely you know they, they're, they're self-motivated mm-hmm. um, now they, f- they may feel that willpower hasn't enabled them to do it um, and because there is a a kind of filter between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind that is kind of like a, um, a referencing barrier and, and willpower won't break through that the, so <coughs> way to explain it to you in a simple way Uh, What I do with clinical hypnotherapy and what we do is we give people control back over parts of their life they feel they've lost control over, Mm -hmm. either from habit or from emotional distress or turmoil, whatever. Whatever area they feel in their life is not in control and they'd like to regain control over, clinical hypnotherapy does it very effectively. And the the way it does it effectively is by relaxation. So we take the stress out of the environment, the stress out of the situation. And people actually sometimes say to me, oh, I couldn't be hypnotized. Well, they hypnotize themselves every day. Have you ever sat at the desk and you've been really busy, fully stressed, working out a problem, and then you go off into a daydream? And you think, what a beautiful day outside. I could be up in the hills. I could be playing golf. I could be doing... And and your mind just wanders, doesn't it? It goes off onto... Now, 
you're at work, you're fully locked onto what you're trying to do, but your mind has decided to go off on a little journey. And that in its essence is hypnosis. You've fallen into a trance of your mm. choice. You've explored a trance and you've gone with that thought. And as a skilled hypnotherapist, that's all you do. You encourage a client to relax. And when they're in that relaxed state, you give some suggestions that enable them to go into a trance. And we do it naturally twice a day, Hugh. So in the morning as we're coming awake and we go from um, theta brainwaves up through into beta brainwaves, we pass through the alpha phase. And that's where we are um, able to program our conscious mind. That's the kind of sleepy, dreamy state just before we open our eyes and wake beta up. Beta is? Yeah. yeah. So no, beta is fully cognitive. That's fully working during the day. Right. Yeah. And then as we go into sleep at night, we drop out of beta and we go into uh, alpha, and into theta, and then eventually into delta. So theta. Yeah. Different brain waves. So how can I explain that to you? So the conscious mind, mm -hmm. conscious mind operates between 14 hertz yeah. to 30 hertz. That's a wave resonation. Yeah. The subconscious mind is from 13 down to one. Very, very low, very relaxed. So, you, so uh, just a, a lower flow of data, basically. Absolutely, yeah. Switch off the cognitive part, this piece behind the eyes, the prefrontal cortex, the mm. rational brain. Occupy that with a different thought process, relaxation. And when that goes into that trance state, you can then work with the, the deeper part of the mind. And the easy way to explain that to people that have no uh, understanding it's of it like, is... Pull that closer from here, it's a bit like... Um, so think pull, about, pull it towards you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Think, about, think about the iceberg. We've seen the film Titanic, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what sunk the what sunk the Titanic? And don't say the captain. <laughs> well, iceberg. Yeah. So was it the bit on the surface that sunk the iceberg that the lookouts could see up on the lookouts? You know that little bit on the surface, or was it the bit underneath that ripped the hull? It was the bit underneath the iceberg, under, underneath the surface, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And what do we know about an iceberg? Ninety percent of it is below the surface. Mm -hmm. Well, our mind is exactly the same. The most powerful part of a glacier is the bit that rips the mountain out, isn't it? You know, rips the valley floor out where all the power is at the bottom of the, the glacier. When it gets to the edge of the sea in Greenland, it carves into an iceberg. And that bottom piece is all underneath the surface. That's where the power is. It's where the power in our mind is. It's below the surface. Mm -hmm. And the language of the subconscious mind is all about emotion. The only language the subconscious mind understands is emotion. Interesting. And, <clears throat> and so it's the most powerful part of our brain. It only has um, a number of purposes. The first part of the deep subconscious mind is to maintain your sanity. That's its purpose. And it maintains your sanity in line with your self-image, what you believe to be true about you. When you're saying mind, though, you you see, I, I was thinking brain there. You, you're referring to a, a part of the brain. Yeah. Not to, okay, I got you. Go on. Yeah. So think about the brain as being the structure mm -hmm. and the energy inside of it being the mind. So... The, but uh, but subconsciously, what, what about the what about the physical or uh, physiological requirements? Like keep breathing, keep your heart beating. Subconscious mind, all all powered by the subconscious mind. Yeah, but it's, we're not conscious. Which is, which, we're not conscious of being able to control our breathing until we make ourselves conscious of it. Yeah, it happens. All, so you and I are sitting here, your heart's beating, but you're not aware mm. of how fast it's beating. The reason I'm asking is because I. I when you're saying it's uh, it's the, the the language is through emotion, that I don't. I'm struggling to understand. Okay, so let me. I'll, I'll share it with you. Cool. So when you have a thought, it's just a little spark of electricity, isn't it, working there, and a new thought is born, or you have a thought which is related to a memory, yeah, and you go back in your mind and you think about something mm -hmm. that you're familiar with. When that thought crosses into an emotion and you attach an emotion to the process, the brain creates a chemical and that chemical then has a biological effect on our body. <clears throat> yeah. Yep. So we think about in the height of stress or let's, let's take, for example, post-traumatic stress. Uh, take the height of that when somebody is in the absolute height of that anxious state. They're actually under a, a, a multifaceted attack their body is under a multifaceted attack because first of all, you've got psychological uh, impact or psychological stress. And then you've got the brain creating chemicals as a result of the emotions. So that's a chemical attack. Those chemicals all go somewhere in the body. Stress doesn't live in your head. Stress lives in your body. So people that are extremely stressed for a long period of time will feel massive aches, and pains in joints, and it can manifest itself in many different ways. So stress lives in the body as a result 
of that chemical process affecting biology. Yeah. So we've got psychological attack. We've got physiological attack. We've got biological and chemical attack all happening at the height of that emotional state. No wonder people feel knackered, mm. absolutely knackered. And if that's been going on for a long time, you know, it, it plays a significant degrading effect on our health. Mm -hmm. Not just psychologically, physically as well. Have you ever heard of um, flow state? Go on. What's your appreciation of flow state? Uh, well, I, I know how you put it. So, in the zone, when you're in the zone, so yeah. you... Everything is effortless. Well, yeah, almost almost subconscious, you know, a skill, a task, a sport. Absolutely. Um, sh shooting, whatever. And there, there is exactly the same principle of the habit. So, you learn a competency through drills and skills. You those silky threads of repetition become so strong that that's that standing operating procedure or that habit or that skill is rock solid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you don't even have to think about it. It's instant. So when something kicks off, you're instantly into standard operating procedure that you've learned and trained and developed to the highest level and you're in flow. Elite athletes do exactly the same. They're in flow. Why is it not? It's not a, or, or it's, it's, yeah, I suppose they would be in that state all the time, wouldn't they? Whenever they're doing that, whatever task they're doing, like a sprinter, for example. But, but then they need to create that state. They create the peak performance state. So they um, cognitively prepare themselves with whatever routine they feel comfortable with, which becomes their habit and their comfort zone. And that prepares them then for that peak performance state. So they, they're very clever about the way they go about it, most of them. Is it the kind of the to get to that, uh, that kind of state of mind? The reason I'm asking you as a, as a clinical hypnotherapist is that in terms of tra training the mind, you know, uh, some, like writing, for example, mm. and I used to do a lot of writing. Sometimes I'd be in the zone writing and it'd fire out on me and other times it wouldn't be there. Is it, is it something that is quite a simple thing to achieve to trigger yourself into a flow state? Yeah. You, you would have had a process that you followed that, that if you analyzed it, it would get you into that flow state. Oh, it could be everything, couldn't it? it could be the, the day, the yeah. night before. Yeah, yeah. It could be yeah, time of yeah. day when you're most productive. Mm -hmm. It could be uh, emotionally you're feeling great and you're feeling inspirational and you're going to inspire somebody with what you're going to write. Therefore, mm -hmm. it flows from you. You know, you know, when you want to do something, it's very easy to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If you're having to do it, it's very difficult to do. Yeah. So, so, if, so where, do you, where do you work at the moment then? So I, I, I live up in Huddersfield, West Yorkshire, um, and I've got clients all over the UK. Uh, I work from home, but I also work from clients' premises as well. Mm -hmm. So I work in in the corporate industry doing still a lot of coaching and training and development. Uh, I work with a great organisation called Get the Edge over in Lincolnshire and we do a lot of um, corporate type of engagement where we take people out into the outward bound arena and give them learning experiences um, and debrief them back into business, so teamwork, leadership. Like what kind of learning experience? Uh, we do command tasks. Huh. So we'll give them a team, um, we'll put a team of people together, maybe from a number of different businesses or a management team inside a business, different departments, different silos, perhaps that don't communicate with each other as well as they could do. And we give them a set of tasks to do. And then we debrief the tasks against, you know, what is it they're trying to change in the business? What are they trying to enhance? Teamwork, communication, interdepartmental communication, strategy, whatever it is they're trying to develop in the business. Uh, we put the tasks around those. How did you become involved with the military then? Well, my dad was a career soldier, so for the first 19 years of my life, I, I lived and wherever mum and dad went, that's where I went. Me and my brother, we, we travelled all over the world with dad. Uh, he was fortunate to, uh, enough to get a garrison position in Dortmund. He was Royal Artillery uh, in West Germany. So we got my brother and I got most of our secondary year schooling done in Dortmund, which was great. Yeah. Most people don't have that luxury there. Two I'm years, three years, they're, they're off out somewhere else. And then uh, at the age of 19, mum and dad decided they were moving back to the UK. And, you know, Hugh, I'd never lived in the UK. We'd always lived abroad, you know. Oh, really? So whenever we, oh, I did a spell in Plymouth when Dad was with two nine inside the, the kind of abroad. the citadel, yeah, kind of abroad, kind of abroad in <laughs> Plymouth, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, we'd, we'd migrate to Scotland on holidays when we came back. Um, but I'd never, I'd never been to school apart from very junior primary school. So what, what do you mean? I'd never been to to a school in the UK apart from oh, at the UK, very early yeah, age. Yeah, yeah. So most of my uh, primary schooling was done abroad and most of my, well, all of my secondary schooling was done in, in Germany. <clears throat> so I got a job with a local unit, uh, Royal Army Ordnance Corps, um, as a, a civilian clerk. Um, and because I spoke fluent German, I eventually did some interpreting and came back to the UK at the age of 26. So I had a really nice lifestyle living out in Germany and skiing three months of the year. And Was that when your dad got out? My dad came back when I was 19 and I stayed on for another seven years. Oh, yeah. nice. So yeah, I enjoyed it. And how did you 
go f- what did you do when you come back then well, how did you go f- how, so are you, how are you where you are now doing so I, I, I was I was working for um, as a civilian employee working for a military supply depot in Dortmund at the time and uh, at the, you know when the big military exercises used to be on in the 80s in, in up against the East German border, so uh, Barry Groves was a, a young sort of captain uh, t- taking control of the uh, the department, and his responsibility was to go out and coordinate the uh, the infrastructure for these exercises. So we'd get uh, Forestry Commission clearance to be able to use the Forestry Commission with stone quarries for fuel dumps, uh, river crossings, heli landing zones, etc. And that was Barry's role. But because Barry didn't speak German, and I did. He asked me if I'd, I'd assist him for a couple of days um, outside of the office, which I thoroughly enjoyed doing. And he said, you know, you're technically doing my job for me here. Uh, he said, you ought to really consider, you know, coming back to the UK and signing up and, and doing something for yourself because I think you've got the right aptitude. And so I came back to uh, to do that. I came back, I passed uh, the qualifications to get into Sandhurst, but um, there was a, a gap of uh, space between in, uh, induction. And they said, look, just go off and get yourself, you know, physically fit do some upper body work and uh, keep yourself busy. Um, and I smashed the bridge of my foot in training mm. a couple of weeks before induction and um, had to have it plastered. It should have been surgically mended, actually. But I said to them, well, you know, if you if you operate, how long will I be out of action? They said, uh, probably 12 weeks. It's quite a bad shatter. You've broke both metatarsals. I said, I said, if you plaster it, they said, well, probably four to six weeks, you'll be fine. And then I had to go to the Navy recruitment office at Aberdeen and they said, what's the scar on your knee? And I said, well, that's just an old injury I had. Well, what was the injury? And I honestly told them what it was. And they said, well, that's a disbarment injury, so you're not even qualifying to get in now. So oh that was the end God. of my military opportunity. What was the injury? Uh, I had a, something called osteochondral disicast. Part of the bone was sort of breaking away and flaking inside the kneecap and it was locking the kneecap sometimes. So I saw a sports specialist in Germany, took a sliver of uh, shin bone, implanted it with two screws. Uh, to, to basically bond it back together. And I was 16 weeks non-weight bearing. But, you know, I'd played squash, I'd run a marathon, I'd done all sorts of stuff since then. Run a marathon, you ran 66 marathons, haven't you? Not Ultra then. marathons. Yeah, that was when I was 26. <laughs> I, I did my first marathon at 25, to be honest. Yeah. And I didn't do another one until I was 45. It's called a long recovery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did, uh, well, I left in, when I get out, 2011, and I'd done a bit of, I didn't, I didn't do much, fitness-wise, I did a, a lot of, um, not yeah, cross training is what you call it, you know, body weight stuff yeah. and fun and bit of um jujitsu and stuff like that. A little bit of running, not loads. And then last year, or was it the year before? Last year, last September, I did a forty mile walk. And I mean walk. It was a forty mile walk for 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 a local um girls football team raised money for that. Flipping neck. So I I reckon for me to fully recover, and I'm not joking, it was six or seven months. I was, you know, you have usual stuff after I got my, my heel, whole, whole of each heel completely came off. Um, lost a couple of toenails, but my, over the, the few weeks after I finished it, my whole of my, both heels completely <coughs> came off. Where just, they hadn't been used to doing all that kind yeah. of stuff. Toenails are surplus to requirement anyway, don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> no toenails, the toenails, they're well, just easy. extra weight. The heels wasn't nice, the heels <laughs> was nice. Um, but I, every morning I get out of bed and my left foot would be, Agony, pain through one just through one of the bones. Yeah, I, yeah. Remember, I don't know what the long, the long, you know, the long, mm-hmm. long day through agony every yeah. morning. It would only last about five minutes. And it would go, but every morning that was six or seven months. Fucking forty <laughs> miles. Yeah, you know, I when I when I was when I was in, I did like fifty miles with a kit. You know, yeah. But you're conditioned, it. aren't you? Yeah, and, you, and you're constantly on it. You're constantly locked on. Your physical fitness oh, is up. Your yeah. mindset's right. Your mindset's right. It took a week right. to get over the fifty miles. I did forty mile walk with nothing. I was in tatters. I was yeah. in tatters. I was feeling it. That was my age as well. I think. My age. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because it was after that situation where I collapsed through stress, and then I left that position eventually and uh, moved on. And there was one. You know, sometimes you you wake up and the minute you put your feet on the floor, that little voice in your head won't leave you alone. It just keeps beating you up. And this day, I remember it. I remember this day, my voice, the little voice in my head just said, it just went on an absolute <laughs> negative rant. What about all those things you were going to do? You know, what about all those dreams, goals and aspirations you had? You know, you've done none of it. You're just all mouth and trousers, you know. What about, I'd seen this race across the Sahara called the Marathon de Saab. It's five and a half marathons back to back across the Sahara. And in my corporate career, I'd, I, you know, I went to many sort of big corporate events and I'd seen inspirational speakers on stage talking about various achievements and uh, I remember vividly 
uh, seeing a guy on stage talking about having completed the marathon to start the toughest foot race in the world, five and a half marathons back to back across the Sahara. And then sort of six years later, seven years later, I'd seen another speaker talking about having completed that race. And it kind of brought those memories back from the first speaker. And the thing that inspired me more than anything, apart from the wonderful picture that they painted with words about what the Sahara looked like at midnight, you know, mm. canopy of sky, canopy of stars and the, maj the majesty of the dunes and the Berber people. Both of those athletes had every reason in the world not to even consider the marathon. So I'm not talking, this is back to 2005, you know, I'd seen these guys seven years before. And uh, one of them was a double amputee, Chris Moon. Uh, um, he was uh, injured in a uh, charity landmine clearing exercise, took his leg and his arm off. And the other guy was a guy called Miles Hilton Barber, who's a blind, uh, blind athlete. And, you know, so he, with his sighted guide, I tackled the marathon sun. Both of them succeeded. Mm. And I was sitting there, you know, in the audience visiting because I'd said five years ago, oh, I'm going to do that. And I hadn't done it, you know. And there was nothing physically wrong with me. But mindset wise, I'd never committed to it. So when I left the corporate world, I decided I would commit to it. And I did that day. My little negative voice wouldn't stop beating me up. I thought I've got to put a stop to this. So yeah, I'm going to do something. One of those things I said that I was going to do, I'm going to do. And I realized I'd parked all of my dreams and goals in a place I call One Day Isle. Mm -hmm. you know? And I say this to, to clients, I say, you know, I'll give you a thousand pounds if you can open your diary right now and show me a page that says one day. Because there isn't, you know, there's a specific day on a specific week of a specific month in a specific year. But as long as you keep saying one day, it will never happen. Mm. But you pick a date and you mark it in the calendar and you make a commitment. It happens on that day and everything changes. Mm. And so, you know, I'd been made redundant from the PLC I was working for and I'd kind of worked my way out into it. And for sort of a period of six months, I was struggling to find another senior management level at the level that I was at. I was probably one of only five people that did what I did at that level in the industry at the time. And, uh, yeah, I thought, right, I'm going to start doing some of the things that I want to do. And, you know, I got a massive lift of inspiration from that. I got a massive boost of, you know, the, the kind of runner's high and stuff when I made the decision to tackle the marathon to Saab. And I remember joining the running club in Weatherby, where I used to live in Harrogate. The, the, the local club was Weatherby. And uh, on the 6th of January, 2006, the race was April 2007. So I gave myself just over a year to prepare. On the 6th of January... I went for a three mile run <laughs> around the town in Weatherby and I stopped for a stitch I didn't have <laughs> and I stopped to tie a shoelace. It wasn't undone. <laughs> and I did have the courage to tell him the only reason I was running is because I was trying to get fit to take on the toughest foot race in the world and I couldn't even run three miles without stopping. <laughs> but, you know, I broke the inertia. Uh, they ran on a Wednesday and a group of them went out cross country on a Saturday. So I ran twice a week with them and I found another running club that ran on a Tuesday and Thursday. So I got myself some inertia. I broke the inertia. I got some momentum going four days a week and that made all the difference. Mm. And then I started to strategize and get a plan. Then I started looking for people that had succeeded in the race, you know, tapping into them and, you know, what did you learn? What would you do differently if you were going back next year? And that distance became shorter and shorter. And before you know it, you're on the start line. Mm. And it was an amazing experience. Six days? Yeah, five and a half, uh, six and a half, five and a half marathons in six days. Yeah. So you've got two days of acclimatization. You've got a kit check day and a medical kit check day because you've got a compulsory kit you've got to take. Two and a half thousand calories a day, rehydratable. And then all your, your, your stuff. So you've got two days to kind of acclimatize the heat and then, then you're, in, you're on it. And of course, the packs are the heaviest. They're about 25 pounds probably in weight. Oh, plus not, not light then. Plus you're carrying about uh, three liters of water, four liters of water. Yeah. And then they supply water at the checkpoints that you need to navigate to. How, how far apart are the checkpoints? Then? 10K, 12K, some of them. Okay. But, you know, in 40 degree heat, that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I followed one girl out of a checkpoint and she'd put her platypus in the back of her rucksack and obviously it had loosened oh, as she no. put it in and I'm just following a trail of water. And she was oblivious to it because it was so far at the back of the pack, you know. Oh, God. But, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's all about strategy, isn't it? It's about personal management. It's about, you know, having the right uh, mindset and mm. attention to detail. Mm. But it's a fantastic adventure. Absolutely fantastic adventure. I'm sure I've got a, a friend who's, who's, I say friend, he's not a friend, he's an old work colleague, um, who, he's three parallel. In fact, he's still serving. His name's um, Herbie Hyde, An Anthony Hyde. He's coming on. But he's he's just done, last year, quite recently, this year, we're in 2018 still, just done it. He's, I, I forget what the event was. Um, basically, I think it was five marathons across uh through the jungle 
Yeah, oh yeah, jungle. Yeah, there's a number of races across there. There's the four desert race and there's jungle. He's doing another one. He's got he's got, he's got, he's got, got another one in January. It's 280 mile or something. I think it is, but he. Uh, I, I'm just trying to think. But or oh, is it the? I don't know what it is. It, whether, it's, whether it's the marathon de Sable. What's in January? What? When is the marathon de Sable? Uh Normally about March, April, into March, into April. Starts in January. I don't know what that is, but he's coming on. Yeah, there's um, loads of them. There's loads of great events around if you if you've got that mindset. You know, you have you heard of uh, the Moab 240? No. It's a it's a race out in the states and it's two hundred and thirty seven miles non stop, so um, yeah, you just start and you keep going. And yeah. you, you, they do bad water as well. One hundred thirty five one hundred thirty five miles uh, through Death Valley. Oh my god, that's another one. There's loads of there's, there's fantastic. I mean, the year after I did the marathon sub, there was a race in Namibia called the Namib- Namibian Desert twenty four hour extreme endurance race, but it was seventy eight miles in twenty four hours non stop. Mm. You know, and it was forty six degrees at ten o'clock in the morning. And there is no shade. You're just no, exposed to yeah, it, you know? Yeah. The first marathon took a guy, well, one of the guys who was running w- was a two hour 50 marathon man. So London marathon, two hours 50. First marathon took him seven hours. Jesus. Yeah. That's, that's and it was during that process I kind of come up with the idea of actually, it's, it's quite interesting actually, because I was 45, 46 then. And uh, when I did a marathon at 25, I hated it because I was running with guys that were in the military and they were much faster than me. And I was trying to run at their pace. Mm. Big mistake. But because my kind of ego wouldn't let me fall behind, I kind of kept up with them. And I just, you know, beasted myself around the, around the route, just hanging on to them for dear life. But I hated it. Hated it. And then uh, when I got the bug for the marathon to Saab, I started to enjoy it because I had this stamina that came from nowhere for some reason. You know, I think as you mature, you've got more stamina. I didn't have that maturity when I was 25. And when I tackled the marathon to Saab, I thought, well, it can't have been the toughest foot race in the world if I finished it, and along with 700 other athletes from 35 countries. So, you know, maybe there's something to this. And then I found this Namibian race. So the longest day in the Sahara is a 52-mile day. So on day four, when you're knackered, Mm -hmm. you know, they stretch the distance to double the distance. Um, And that was interesting. And we had a death on the race. You know, one of the top 45 competitors in the world passed away during the race. It's that tough. It is a tough race. Dehydration, I think. Probably, yeah. yeah. I think they, when the autopsy, uh, they found that the blood was very viscous, so possibly. And whilst they'd stamped his card and he'd taken the correct entitlement of water, because they give you plenty of water, at the end of your stage each day, you've got four and a half litres, but they can't guarantee you drank it. That's the thing, you can't take it in. Uh, and that's funny share and that's that. personal discipline, isn't it? Yeah, going back to that, that 50 mile there, um, it's, I, I, uh, I came off that finished that, that and uh oh yeah i'd looked after everyone else except for myself mm. and i think i started with five liters or five six liters of, of water i think when i came in i'd only had about three quarters of a liter 50 miles <sighs> and yeah i know and 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 each show when i when i got in the door and i was away from the guys and the, I was on, I was a wreck. I was yeah, on the floor. Yeah, yeah. I was I was Depleted. I'd eaten twice because yeah. they didn't have meals. But water wise, I'd probably have three quarters of a liter. But yeah, mm. you're firing all four cylinders, you know, and mm, adrenaline's not a big one with it because of that kind of distance. Adrenaline plays a sort of not the same role as doesn't like in, yeah. in shorter things. But I I felt good. Focus on the, all the other guys. It's one of those as well. You know, there's an end. It's like you're not getting there to yeah, fight yeah. a battle to. So you. Basically, my administration took a flipping back. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. a big mistake, big mistake. Well, finish it, fine. Yeah. Go in the house, collapsed. Wreck, you know, yeah. I, I was on the on the hallway. As soon as they're on the on the floor, and all all hit me. Yeah. And um, I remember saying <clears throat> to my partner at the time, "I need, I need, I need something. Just get mm-hmm. get me. Something. I need something. I need something." And she got a sausage roll. <laughs> I was out the fridge, like mini bite sized <laughs> sausage rolls. Give the part. I, I, I put. Put one in my mouth, and as soon as he went in my mouth, is that uh, almost almost uh, placebo? As soon as yeah. I started chewing, yeah. the body knew it was getting something. I started slightly feel better, and then, and then it was water. I thought, "You fucking idiot, <laughs> fucking idiot." <laughs> well, you learn those. At least it wasn't in front of the guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, you learn from those mistakes, don't you? I know. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. And so that journey, I kind of I, I started getting fascinated about extreme endurance and, and the mindset, the peak performance mindset of these guys. You know, how do you get to that that state of belief that you can do anything? And I came across this guy in America who was called Mr. Ultra Marathon Man, and uh, his name was Dean Carnassius. And I, I came across his story, which um, North Face were branding into the running arena, so from the mountaineering kit and the expedition kit into running kit. They didn't have a pair of shoes, so he kind of get got together with them and created this pair of shoes that they would break into the running arena with. And so he said, I'll put on an endurance event that will capture the world's attention as a high brand profile event. 
And he ran a marathon a day for 50 days. So in each of the 50 mainline states of America, he, he ran a marathon a day and he called it the Endurance 50. And I was fascinated. You know, I thought, oh my God, you know, it was hard enough running five, mar- five and a half marathons, six days across Sahara. And then to do Namibia, which was a triple marathon, 21 hours I finished it in. Um, I, I, I thought, how can you have the mindset that enables you to do that every day for 50 days? <clears throat> and so I kind of become curious. And I thought, well, I wonder what the most anyone's ever done is. So I looked it up on the old Google. And Guinness World Records was 52 marathons in 52 days with no day's rest. And I thought, well, I wonder why Mr. Ultra Marathon Man stopped at 50 mm. when exactly the same successful process, the peak mindset and the performance process would have got him a new world record if he just applied it for another three days. And then that little voice came back and said, <laughs> go on then, Gobby, if you think it's that easy. And I thought, well, actually, I understand his process. You know, I, I knew I had a process that enabled me to perform and I had skills and I had drills and disciplines that I used effectively to get the results I got. And I recognized what his were. And they kind of overlapped really well onto mine. But he had a reason. He had a big enough reason to make him want to do it. Well, profile for him and profile for North Face. He was a branded athlete. You know, their, <coughs> their sponsor, if you like, their ambassador. And I thought, well, if I had a strong enough reason, I probably would have a go. And I just thought, well, what kind of reason could I find that would be really important to me? And during, in the planning and preparation for uh, the Marathon de Saab, my dad had passed away from cancer in 2006 and uh, a military charity supported him in his decline in health if you like uh, abf the soldiers charity supported him and at the time health for heroes were very very prominent in the news uh, in 2010 and of course austerity was kicking in then and everybody was looking for that expendable pound that people could throw around and funny enough i'd reconnected with barry groves the young captain that was uh, my boss about 22 years previously and we'd reconnected and we were having lunch one day in I'd left the corporate industry and I'd set up my own consultancy. And he said, so what are you thinking of? And I said, well, I've got this really funny idea. I'm thinking about challenging the world record for marathons because he knew I'd run across the Sahara, etc." And he said, well, just tell me about it then. I said, well, it'll, it'll be inside the mainland UK. I won't go abroad with it, but I'm looking for a military charity. And I thought, well, you know, Help for Heroes has got a lot of profile at the moment. Pick them. And it was Barry, actually, that reminded me of ABF, a soldier's charity. And he said, actually, I think they'd be a much better charity. Um, they're the Army's national charity. And coincidentally, in 2010... It was their 66th anniversary because uh-huh. they'd been around. They were established in 1944 at the end of the Second World War to support fam- uh, soldiers and their families for life. Uh, and so we approached them and I would said to Guinness, you know, I, I'm intending to set a new world record. Uh, I'll challenge the 52 marathons, 52 days, and I'll run 66 marathons in 66 days in 66 cities of the UK. <laughs> Because I did a bit of research and there were 66 cities in the UK. <laughs> is, so, it, is it bang on 66 cities? In 2010 <laughs> there was, yeah, yeah. And it's nothing to do with having a cathedral or a university. They just have to have a charter from the sovereign that states you're granted the status of city. Got you. Uh, and there were 15 in England, five in Wales, five in Northern Ireland and six in Scotland. So we started in, we, we planned a, a route that started in Leeds and we did a 360 degree tour of the UK finishing in York. Uh, 10 months into the planning and preparation of that. So Guinness said that, that they must be marathons that are open to the public to participate in. Yeah. Okay. So you've got to have official races that are timed. Oh God, that and, it a bit. And professionally measured, measured with a surveyor's wheel. So we've got accuracy of distance. <laughs> uh, and this all needs to be verified. Uh, and it's 12 and a quid to close a road. So that wasn't going to be viable. So at the time when... Um, 2010 austerity is biting councils are laying people off left right and center i connected with all the sports development officers for each of the cities and i said look have you got a city park um that you can measure the routes that people walk in the park and they all did that for us and then we just scaled it up uh 10 months into that planning and preparation uh, a friend sent me this email said andy have you seen what this belgique runner's doing i said no what's he doing so funny enough he's uh, contesting the same world record you are except he started 47 days ago mate oh my god <laughs> And uh, he's got bigger balls than you because uh, he's, said, he's declared publicly he's going to run a marathon a day for a year to set a new world record. Jesus, that's not <laughs> possible. Sure. You know, this is it, you know, the, the power of belief, the power of that peak performance yeah. mindset. Yeah. And so I started following him on social media and sort of checking him out and see what he was doing. And yeah, he was doing a great job. And he got to day 47 and, he, you know, he hadn't stopped and he wasn't going to stop at 52 and he certainly wasn't going to stop at 66. So I thought, well, 10 months of... You know, a lot of planning and preparation can't be wasted. So I said to Guinness, what's the next most difficult level in America? Because I can't go time-wise. I'm going to have to go difficulty. And they said, well, we don't have a record on the books, but there is the International Association of Ultramarathoners. 
and they start at 50 kilometers a day. Uh, or f sorry, 50 kilometers an event, um, 100 kilometers, 160 kilometers, or 200 kilometers. I thought, well, I'll take the easy one. <laughs> I'll go with 50 because it's only five miles more than a marathon, isn't it? You know, a marathon's uh, 42k, uh, an ultra marathon's 50k, or 26 miles, 26.2 miles, or 31.07 miles. So I thought I'd go for that. So we just scaled up the distances on each one and we set off to do that. Um, and it was all to raise money and awareness for ABF, the soldiers' charity. Uh, and funny enough, we the British Army recruit from each of those cities. So it just made sense. It made perfect sense. It was yeah. a nice hand in glove fit. And they were struggling to get, you know, um, that expendable pound. And I thought, well, this is a great high profile event. Would you like to be the beneficiary? And they said they'd love it. And well, so we set off to do that on the 16th of March, 2011. Um, I set off in Leeds. And then on day two in Bradford, I tore my Achilles tendon. Oh God. <laughs> so, you know, th there you go. Uh, and the sensation was I, I got this stabbing sensation in, in, the, in the right Achilles uh, on running down a steep concrete descent. So I, I had a sports injury therapist on the team just for remedial massage, etc. Uh, a young lass who was only five months out of university uh, in her first business, if you like, as a sports injury therapist. And I said, Sophie, I said, I've got a real stabbing pain in my ankle. I said, you need to check it for me. I think I might have kicked a thorn into my sock or something. And she looked at it. She said, oh, Andy, I said, oh. I could feel some nodules that I, th I think you're actually torn your Achilles tendon. Of course, I'd never torn a tendon. She said, I didn't have a clue. I just felt a little bit of discomfort. And I said, so what does that mean then? She said, well, I think it's game over. Uh, I can't see you being able to continue to run on that. I said, well, it's not painful at the moment. I'll just keep running and let's see what happens at the end of the day. So, of course, at the end of the day, it was painful. Mm. It, you know, I was, I, that happened about five miles into the day. So by the time I got to 31 miles, I was feeling it a little bit. But the next morning in Hull, I was on the start line. Uh, and I said, look, our job is just to get me to the finishing line. It'll take a bit longer. It doesn't really matter. There's no time scale on how quick the marathons need to be completed, but they need to be completed every day. And then uh, it got worse and worse and worse. And of course, if you presented to a doctor with a torn Achilles tendon, what, what would they say? Can you fucking sitting down for the next six yeah. months, buddy? No way, Barry. Yeah, stop <laughs> yeah. running. Don't do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but Guinness World Record said 66 days, no days rest. So if we'd quit on day two... 10 months of planning and preparation down the drain. Yeah. You know, we'd arranged, uh, the, the crazy thing was trying to liaise with 66 city councils, 66 health and safety departments, you know, trying to arrange civic receptions on 66 consecutive days so the charity could benefit from the exposure, the profile. And uh, we challenged all the cities to raise a thousand pounds. So we were trying to raise 66,000 pounds for the charity. <clears throat> um, and, you know, when you're locked on and when you're committed, you know, you can push through obstacles, can't you? You can get through anything because you're locked on and you're committed to what you're trying to do. You're delivering your CV, aren't you? You're being the best version of you that you can be. And that's all we did as a team. You know, I, I had a fantastic team of people working with me. Sophie did her job. She became fascinated about how to solve this problem because everyone she phoned said it's impossible, it can't be done. Tell them to rest it, ice it, compress it and elevate it. I said, you know, you're a chartered member of the Sports Injury Therapy Society of Great Britain. They work with Commonwealth athletes and Olympians. Ask them of any of their therapists anywhere in the world worked with an athlete with a torn Achilles tendon who's insisting on running it back to health. And they just laughed. Said, no, no. <laughs> nice try, but we can't give you any advice. You know, she phoned ASICS, the shoe sponsors, and said, can we change the shoes? She found different ways of lacing it. We found different mechanisms. And, you know, just one day at a time, we worked our way through it. Um, day seven in Nottingham, one of the ambassadors for the charity came down to start the day. Uh, and he was a double amputee. Mm. Yeah, Nathan Cumberland, uh, Lance Corporal Nathan Cumberland. And I gave up the right to complain about a sore ankle there and then mm. when I'm standing next to a guy, you know, with no legs. Mm. And I'll never forget Nathan's words. I said, Nathan, you know, I'm running today on my own. I've got nobody running with me. I'm just going to be spending the next seven hours uh, running around this, this, this park. I said, I need some inspiration, mate. And he said, Andy, what can I tell you? Just keep doing what you're doing. I've been following you on social media. He says, you're doing an amazing job. And I said, well, you know, share your story, share some inspiration. He said, well, <clears throat> all I can tell you is my journey of recovery has been quite a tough one. He said, I've had 17 operations and I've had MRSA five times. Oh, any Jesus of those, Christ. any of that could have been fatal. He said, my price of success, mate, is to, to have another five operations before I can fully use my limbs the way I want to use them, you know, uh, and to give me full use of, of my potential. He said that the risk for me or the price I have to consider is that I might contract MRSA again and any time it could be fatal. He said, that's the price I've got to pay, mate. The price you've got to pay is just go out there and put one foot in front of the other today mm. until you get to the finishing line. 
because I made a choice. He said, my Jag's parked over there. He says, you can see the white one. He said, it's about 200 yards away from the big RV that you guys have got. And I saw Sophie working on you on the bed and you walked away from the team when she finished working on you. Why did you walk away? I said, because I was in tears because it was painful mm. and I'm, I'm knackered. You know, it's a bit of emotional, a bit of emotional uh, response to just being absolutely fatigued and trying to cope with this pain and, and, and the effort each day. And he said, yeah, he said, I recognize that. I said, I imagine that's what you're doing. He said, but I made a decision there. And then he said, I looked down in the passenger floor well and my two sticks were there. And I had a choice. I could pick those sticks up and walk over to meet you. Or for the first time since my injuries, I could walk without the sticks. He said, so you've inspired me to walk 200 yards for the first time ever. Hmm. Uh, just keep doing what you're doing and you know that lifted me mm. that massively lifted me because he is an ambassador for the charity sharing his story and lifted me and I for that next seven hours I was running on air I promise you I can imagine I was just I, he, he did such a great job of lifting me that day when I was mentally knackered and uh, physically in pain and uh, the next day my, my running mentor Rory came down and he ran with me a marathon that day uh, to check my gait and gave me some indicators on changing my gait because I run very narrow he said, I want you to open your... So this is quite difficult because when you've got a habit of doing something, it feels comfortable, doesn't it? Yeah. So you fold your arms that way. Look at which hand's up and look at which one's down. Mm. Yeah. Well, you fold it the other way. It feels different, doesn't it? I don't it? want to do it. Yeah, you don't, yeah. Because it feels strange. So he said to me, change your running gait. I want you to imagine a rugby ball horizontal between your knees. Keep them that wide apart. And every time you put your right foot on the ground, I want you to press your big toe into the ground and keep the Achilles straight because we're running off road today. And there's a good chance you'll go over on it and it'll, it'll rupture. And so that was really weird. But, you know, at the end of 31 miles, there was no pain that day in that ankle. That change of gait mm. had absolutely made it more stable. And uh, all I can tell you is on day 13, uh, Sophie discharged the injury out of uh, medical care and it never played another part. And we ran it back to health. You never had any issue since? Either. Never since, no. Goodness Absolutely me. not. Yeah. That's crazy, isn't it? And so eventually on the, the 20th of May, 2011, my 50th birthday, we crossed the finishing line. So for the first time ever, having run another kid, he sent him back to health. And first time ever, 66 ultra marathons in 66 How days. How many miles all together? Um, I took in excess of 3.3 million strides, uh, 2,050 miles. <laughs> I counted them all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Never day. missed, never missed day. one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Heck, that's uh, but yeah, amazing time, achievement amazing achievement yeah, well it was inspired it was inspired yeah. by you know the great work the charity do supporting the forces uh, the armed forces especially the army and the great people I met on that journey you know I met many single amputees double amputees uh, and a triple amputee Annie Reid over in um, Warrington was a triple, triple amputee St Helen sorry and you know it, it's just the mindset of these guys is unbelievable you know they, they, they overcome adversity life changing injuries and they just inspired me. All I can say is it was a privilege, yeah. absolute privilege to do that and support them. When we tallied up, you know, the full amount of exposure we got through publicity, PR, newspaper coverage, social media and cash that we'd raised, we'd raised over £450,000 for the charity in total. So Amazing. great result. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what do you, we spoke about this before, before we came on, before we went live, uh, what do you think about? I said it to you. So on, on Twitter, there's a rant going on at the minute. <clears throat> um, it's always rants going on, on Twitter. It's quite a <laughs> negative. It's a, like it's a really, it's a very easy uh, unsensitive social yeah, yeah. media to be negative on. Yeah, even caught. I, I I'm positive most of the time on social media. I've caught myself a couple of times <laughs> today being one of them. Going a bit, you know, not yeah, sort of negative or neutral. Um, and one of them was, was this a, a lady. I can't. Remember, I don't know who it is. Basically, right, she's she's complaining about uh, the fact that the highest paid salary to a charity CEO in the UK at the minute is six hundred six hundred fifty or eight hundred fifty grand a year. Wow, it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, I think they didn't say what charity it was, but I, I know that the, the biggest charity in the UK by turnover is uh, Cancer Research. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but. I I, th I thought about it a lot with with this you know how much should charity bosses senior management get paid anyone in the charity get yeah, paid yeah. and I'm I am on the opinion I I I've got no fucking issue I've I've got no issue with it at all um, I was I was thinking about it earlier uh, like okay so why should you, why should she get eight hundred and fifty k and I was sort of going you know it's more information than just oh we decided to pay eight hundred and fifty k it it's if you my thought is if you're not willing to pay for the talent you haven't got the talent to 
have a business, which yeah, is what yeah, it is, absolutely. to earn all the money. Every um, charity is a business. Yeah, because it's look, you can have the most. I think the argument is well, you should pay them less. You should be doing it for the good of for, for the good of you know the, the people and the, the thing they want to do. Great, mm-hmm. but let's say say we're going to pay you fifty k or hundred k. Say hundred k, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the, and that CEO says, okay, yeah, that's fine, hundred k. Mm-hmm. I'll take that and I'll, I'll still do the work. Be amazing. But they're good at what they do, which is why they're in the position they are. You'll only have another business come knocking on the door and go, uh, excuse me, and it'll be a corporate entity, not a charity. We'll give you 250k to come work for our business and increase our profits, please. Absolutely. And then you've lost that talent from the, yeah. It, it just, it, I, it's, an, don't get me wrong. Uh, it, they have to be worth it. You know, and it has to be relative. If you're going to pay him a sizable amount, it needs to be relative to what that business, how that business is operating. I think it should always be performance based. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, if they if they raise the bottom line by the amount that they're targeted to to raise the bottom line with, then they should receive the bonus. But I personally think that the salaries should be lower, and I think it should be bonus related. So if you achieve the objectives, then the bonus is there. It'd be the same argument with that, though. If you, if you had be, that, it'd be, the, it would be, be yeah. the same people arguing with that, saying, well, why should they get a bonus? It's, it's a charity and you should be... It's, you know. you, you're right. And, and it, if they're standalone charities in a sector of their own, then then that's fine. But, but when I look at the military charities, I mean, you know, you've got H4H, which is tri-service, admittedly, and then you've got a... Pl- I mean, there must be over 300 different military charities all supporting. There's over, there's over 400 is there? now. There's over is 400, there? yeah. yeah. There's over 400 now, yeah. Yeah, it's 400 and something odd. But how much duplication is there well, at the top end? That. No, I mean, there's, there's more than that. Yeah. How much duplication is there at the top end on salaries? You know, you've got two CEOs from two charities that are very similar. But they're all doing different jobs. They're all working with different families, aren't they? You know, what, what do you mean duplication? Well, if you think about um, how, do you, how do you streamline it, how do you make more of that value go to the, the end users? Right. If you've got... 10 charities, 10 guys all earning 100 grand. Yeah. Well, you might as well put them under an umbrella and do the same thing. Because, well, no, because, because effectively, you, when you look at Help for Heroes, they're tri-service, aren't they? So that a lot of other charities oh, could sit under... Could, a lot of, that could be an umbrella organisation that a lot of other charities I sit see, underneath I've, it. And you can strip out... You know, from a corporate perspective, yeah. you would strip out lots of high salaries and you would strip out management structure and you would bring it much more... Flatline. Would you not reckon though that with paying less, you'd have again less talent, and so uh, on an average across the charities, there'd be less money being ma- made. Mm-hmm. Either, I'm being careful like, to admit to be able to donate or to use for charity. But then that's about that's about yeah, how do you, how do you remunerate them? How do you pay them for a job well done? You know, you can give them eight hundred thousand pounds, and they don't hit any objectives, and then they disappear off somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, and they haven't nudged the bar. Yeah, you know? uh, yeah, I, th- I I see what you're saying. I, I do think I, I think money's only one measurement. I think that that, that you have got to look at the the whole benefit to the business as a whole. Uh, what have they done to enhance the business? How have they moved it forward? How have they overcome obstacles they faced? Because mm. the economic environment can be still quite tough for charities. They're looking for that expendable pound, and it's still tough to get hold of. Yeah, Kate, you met Kate England yeah. at the party, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. When she, what a great have job you she's to that doing. Podcast? What a great job she's doing. Yeah, yeah. have you listened to that podcast? Not the full. I, I've she, got into half of it. Yeah. We were talking there about it, and and um, she was saying, and in my experience as well, is how disconnected the different organizations are even though they work together for things you know yeah. uh, <clears throat> from my, my from my experience at the same time i was involved with nhs walking with the wounded nhs walking with the wounded help the heroes royal british legion no one knew what the fuck was going on no one knew what was going Disjointed. on it's not air faults yeah, yeah. and she was saying about a, an organization in the states which is called the va I think it's the Veterans Association yeah. is what it's called. And they the, do what you're talking about. I think it's what you're talking about. Mm. That, that umbrella organisation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, sort of the, the brain of that nervous system of charities mm. and, and they're able to direct the support and stuff. And um, I do think that's a good way to go. Uh, I, I wonder if that I wonder if that's something being considered by the government, to be honest. I mean, there's been enough of a, a stink kicked up over the last few years. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to the charter. The charity, they they set out a charter for how the funds will be used. And they're locked into that. They can't divert the funds anywhere else outside of that charter because otherwise it's, it's you know, they're acquiring funds on false pretenses. They've, they've declared this is what we stand for. This is what we're going to go and raise money for. And therefore that money has been raised for that purpose and that purpose only. It can't be given anywhere else. 
but can you change the chart? I think it's long and complicated because you've got to make technically you should make everybody aware that's donated that we've now changed our charter. So what, what, where you donated the funds, they might not be going there. Mm -hmm. So it's very complicated, I guess, at the top end. Mm. But I don't know too much about that. It's not easy. No, it's not easy. It's a shame because you get it. It, it just makes it more difficult for charities to, to operate. I mean, um, especially the scrutiny of the commander. Uh, it's, with, it, from from, from the perspective of trying to raise money for a charity, as we did with ABF, it's really hard. You want profile. You need to get media coverage now. I mean, it's becoming harder and harder to do the big events because the sponsorship necessary to achieve them is, you know, significant. I mean, and to go to the to Everest is like 40 grand now, you know, to mm. uh, one of the guys at the party was talking about rowing the Atlantic and that's 50 grand, you know, plus and going upwards. Was that Glyn? Yeah. So oh, it, oh, now that was Roy Dixon. Roy, yeah. So, so they need, you know, a lot of corporate sponsorship to be able to achieve just the, the start line, let alone, you know, perform. Yeah. And so you need that profile. And, and I know when we were approaching the media to get media coverage for Challenge 66, um, Many of them said if this was help for heroes, we wouldn't support you. We wouldn't give you the media coverage because they're overexposed. And they were back in the day, you know. They'd only been on the market five five years. They had £100 million in the bank. Great, sexy logo, the guy on the stretcher, you know. And the British public were fully behind mm. our military and, and veterans and, you know, donating everywhere. And they did exceptionally well. But they were overexposed at that time, you know, in the media. And it was difficult to get journalists to cover what we were doing. It was difficult to get them to engage with us and spread the word which is really what you want it's you know it's exposure it's making people aware of what's going on yeah um, and so they, these these big high profile events are becoming more and more expensive to put on and i think you know if you've got great caliber people at the top of the business that can generate that and can create it and drive the revenue into the business the, the charities then i think that's that's where they earn their salt if you like mm. but yeah you could debunk that for years can you yeah no i was wondering if that for that veterans association type establishment or uh, organization whether whether it would be uh, under their sort of remit would be con controlling the exposure and media side of things but that would be impossible mm. they'd all have to you know it's almost like you'd have to get rid of all the charities gone bye bye yeah. and start again military charities start again and, and, and then be all under the one umbrella all sort of offshoots of the va it's a very complicated and very complex area i mean Ultimately, if you, how do you measure how do you measure their success? Well, how many people have been supported and helped? You know, why have we still got veterans committing suicide? Well, always be the case. Why do people commit suicide? You always have that. Well, would you if they got the help they needed? If they got the support they needed? If they got everything they needed to be able to bring them back online? Because ultimately, what is it? It's an emotional situation, isn't it? They're under immense amount of emotional stress. They're under immense amount of pain yeah and I, they, they see the only solution is taking their life the only way to rid myself of this pain or to not be a burden on somebody else is to be eliminating myself from the situation mm, you yeah. know and that's 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 so sad and it's so wrong you know? yeah no um, you're right I, it's, it's um and I, I know i know from working with one young individual a 33 year old veteran from the moment of him declaring he was suicidal as a result of a lot of things in his life a lot of service <clears> but an awful lot of other things it took 83 days to get him face to face with a mental health specialist. You know? I know of a similar situation and a, and a guy killed himself, mm. a friend of mine. Um, and, and that was my fear. The, re the only reason I became a clinical therapist is because at that time when I was coaching and guiding him, I was petrified I'd give him a little bit of tough love and say the wrong thing. Mm. And I said, I'll never find myself in that situation again. And I know now how to decondition uh, trauma. I know very quickly how to bring someone down from an any kind of elevated state and take them into a relaxed place where you can have a conversation and you can start to fix it, you know, help them to fix it, give them the power. All clinical hypnotherapy is, is giving people control back over an area of their life they feel they've lost control over. And it's normally driven by stress. Stress drives the anxiety. The anxiety drives the depression. Mm -hmm. So you break that cycle, you give them their life back. That's true, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was just thinking about Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, psychotherapy. Psych so, clinical uh, hypnotherapist mm. and a clinical psychotherapist. So, clinical hypnotherapy is a blend of a number of different areas. It's uh, cognitive behavioural therapy. It's psychotherapy. It's talk therapy. Um, and it's deep relaxation. Psychotherapy is looking at different areas, and I'm training with um, 
a lot of work at the moment with the Human Givens Institute. Uh, and so they work on the principle of what our basic emotional needs and wants are in life. And that's a slightly different way of looking at it. But it sits hand in glove with clinical hypnotherapy because it's about deconditioning the trauma that the client or the patient is facing very, very quickly and sensitively and briefly, very, very briefly. Uh, and that's the skill. Uh, the danger with a lot of talk therapy is that by asking people with the cognitive part of the brain, the rational bit, to think about the problem or the original trauma and analyze it and look at it from a different perspective, many times you actually re-traumatize them because bringing those memories back and the feelings and emotions that are attached to them is very, very painful. And, you know, dissecting it in minute detail to try and look at it and reference it is very, very painful. And, and, and it doesn't work for a lot of people. It doesn't work. Because the difference between going from the conscious mind into the subconscious mind is that there is a barrier. There is a conflict barrier there. And sometimes it won't let you through. And most of the emotion is in the subconscious mind. It's buried. It's, it's suppressed. You know, that, that, that it's too painful to go there. I'm not bringing that forward. I'm burying that at the deepest levels of my mind. And then because it's buried, it still has a residual energy. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't know. It might be interesting to kind of explore how, how stress actually happens and how we become traumatized. If you think about um, how the body works, it's fascinating. And, and the, the resolution for it is just as fascinating to bring about and very easy to do. The resolution for stress. Yeah, mm -hmm. for post-traumatic stress. So anyone can be under the influence or under the effect of stress from a trauma that happened in the past, post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. um, it can be a civilian, it can be anybody. It doesn't have to be just military. But we know from a clinical hypnotherapy <clears throat> point of view that there is quite a large predisposition to post-traumatic stress if they've had difficult childhoods. Oh. So the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, sorry, is, is normally formed by the age of six or seven. So all of the emotional interaction, and when we're born, our brain has uh, partly formed templates. Yeah, uh, How can I explain that in a way that people will understand? So you know from scans of women that are pregnant that babies can smile in the womb. I didn't know that. They can, yeah. But a baby's got no reason to be able to smile in the womb because what's it smiling at? Yeah. There's nothing for it to recognize or to understand that this this thing I do with my mouth will get a response. So that's a basic DNA template. And that's because when the baby when the baby is born, now mammals and animals, they can get up and run straight away. We need cared for for about nine months. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of our development is cerebral, whereas an animal, a, a cow, a calf, a deer, they're up and running straight away from a predator, aren't they? Potential predator from a fox or, or a wolf. They've got to be able to mobilize themselves instantly. So they're developing a different way than we do. But ours is all about cognitive development and, and these templates in the brain have to be uh, developed. And so a baby smiles because when it recognizes eye contact with mum, the instinct is to smile because it's a disarming element. And the baby gets cuddled and the baby gets loved because the baby's cute. Mm -hmm. So we've got lots of templates that are laid down like that, which drive our emotional um, development as a, as, a, as a young child. And we are conditioned by all of the things that happen to us in those early years. We're like sponges because the prefrontal cortex, the cognitive part, the rational bit of the brain doesn't work. It's not mature enough to start working until beyond that age. So anything that's fed into us at that age becomes our default mechanism, our programming, if you like. So if we, if we know someone's had a very difficult childhood, um, emotionally, physically they've been bullied or abused or whatever's happened in that childhood it can be a predisposition for ptsd so if you think about that kind of lifestyle um let's bring it into a military environment that um is kind of like cocking the mechanism mm -hmm. the incident that might happen in service um is like pulling the trigger. So the, the mechanism is cocked. The, 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 the magazine is fully loaded with a lot of emotional shit. Mm. Yeah. When the trigger's fired, the recoil can be felt for the rest of your life. But it's all emotional and it's all linked to, in that scenario, it would all be linked to what happened 
that set the mindset for how I deal with emotion. Does that make sense? Yeah. It, it doesn't mean that anybody that's had a difficult childhood would automatically develop PTSD, but it, it can be a large uh, pre predisposition to it. And some people have traumatic effects and have no Ill, Ill effects at the end of it. They don't develop it, but some people do. And we don't know why, but we know how it happens. There's an interesting book got written earlier, earlier this year called um, Blueprint. Uh, by a guy called Robert Plowman. No, don't know. He's a, a behavioral geneticist. Mm -hmm. um, I won't get into too much detail on it. I've, had, I, I, I've been harping on about this for the last three weeks. Uh, not on the mic, off the mic. <laughs> this book has blown my mind. But it's he's talking about that, like you were saying, their template. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the impact of the genes you've got from your parents and how that influences your behaviour. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, the book has been, it's not, it's been well received, but also it's coming for a right slate in because people are misinterpreting what's yeah. been said. Um, um, uh, and it, it goes so far as, you know, it's science, it's, 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 like, it's fact, you know, but it's all based on probability. So, so they, so they know, for example, that, um, if you're, oh, I'll choose an easy one. Choose a, not an easy one, simple one. One that's not controversial. <laughs> uh, uh, if your parents have got an allergy, one or more of your parents have got an allergy, then, then it, you're something like 53, 54% likely to develop that Pre allergy. Predisposed. To, yeah. Yeah. But it's, but, you know, it's predisposed. Yeah. yeah genes. Yeah, yeah. But it, the behavioral side, I, I recommend this book. Good. It, yeah. I'll get into it. It's yeah. absolutely brilliant because, um, well, here we go. Here's one of the stats, right? So if your parents, get divorced, you are more likely to get divorced too as one of the children. But you think, okay, well, that's, ob that's <coughs> obvious because my parents got divorced. And I experienced it. Yeah. yeah, and, and, you know. And this is how I handle a difficult exactly. situation, yeah. But they know that. So, yes, that is a factor, right? The fact that you experienced it. But even before they get divorced, mm. you've already got the genes in you from them that predisposes you to get divorced before they've done it. Oh, okay. Let's take it into genetics. Yeah, okay. because they, they've they got those genes, so you've got those genes. You don't, mm. They could be the kind of parents that, look, they, look, say, let's stay together for the sake of the kids. Mm. And da, 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 da. Yeah, it's one of those. You, you, you're you still likely to get, probably going to get divorced. It's not definite. Okay. It doesn't mean your parents get divorced. You are. But the point is, the genetic, the, the realization, that, okay, it's a genetic influence. So you're telling me that even before my parents get divorced, I'm probably getting divorced because they're going to get divorced even mm. before it's happened kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's predetermined. Yeah, it's brilliant imagine, book. Yeah. But he, he, he does do well. He does, he, he says it repeatedly in there. He says you have to, you know, he, it's a blueprint. It doesn't mean it can't be changed. Sure. It doesn't mean if your parents get divorced, you're yeah. going to get divorced. It means you, you probably, you're more likely to. Mm. Based on our findings, all twin studies and all that. There's over, over about 40 years as well. It's not, you know, a six month thing with a, with a, a 200 people they study. It's thousands and thousands yeah, and thousands yeah. of people across the world, across the world. It's amazing. He's an American guy. It's, it's, a, it's a good book. It's a good Bruce book. Lipton's a really good guy to look at. If you're interested in that Bruce stuff. Yeah. So Bruce he's an epigeneticist. It's to, he started off doing brain stem, brain stem uh, work way back in the 60s. Uh, he fascinatingly found out that um, the DNA expresses itself depend upon the culture that the DNA finds itself in. So talk that through. He explains it. If I take um, some brain cells and I replicate them, yeah, so I've got 150 brain cells that are all identical because I've taken it and I've cloned it and I've replicated yep. it. I've got 50 in one dish, 50 in one dish, 50 in one dish. If I change the culture, the, 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 the environment that those cells are in, this cell becomes brain cell, that becomes bone, and that becomes muscle. I think you're talking about when you say environment, it's simple as changing from a petri dish to something uh, like Just changing the culture yeah, in the petri yeah, dish, yeah. 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 And, and he explains um, the fascinating bit that if we are under an immense amount of stress, then our chemical composition of our body becomes toxic. That changes the way that DNA can express itself. And that's mm. how cancers are formed. Ah. Because it's the toxic environment that the DNA finds itself in, the gene that develops the cancer and bruce says it takes 12 genes to, to create cancer so that means you've got to have quite a toxic environment in that part of the body for whatever reason in order for that to flourish so 12 genes with mutations yeah so but, if you're more stressed then you're more likely to be prone to cancer and absolutely I absolutely i don't think i knew that I didn't yeah know, I knew the the longer you've got stress so the way that the body works so stress is actually a defense mechanism in the body it's natural and it's good for us yeah 
go back into the days of uh, the African plains, you know, if you were being chased by a, a lion, well, how much energy would you want available to escape the lion? Mm. Lots and lots. All of it, yeah. So everything that's non-essential to you escaping that fight or flight um, gets switched off by the body. And it does that the way that the brain works with stress. So the autonomic nervous system separates into the sympathetic nervous system um, and the, the, the sympathetic adrenal medullary access, which is that primary part, is instantly involved in producing noradrenaline and adrenaline. So your first response to stress is adrenaline. And that opens up the heart and makes it pump a lot faster. We breathe a lot quicker. We get much more oxygen sucked in. It opens up all of the vessels and pumps all of that oxygenated blood to the muscles so they can fight us or they can fuel us for fight or fuel us for fight. Yeah. So that's the, the first part of the stress system. And that happens instantaneously in milliseconds. That's the instance mm -hmm. of survival. Yeah. Uh, something kicks off and I need to respond. So that, that system is fired up straight away. A couple of seconds later, it starts producing cortisol. And cortisol's purpose is to, sh it's a really important uh, chemical, but its primary, uh, re primary purpose in stress is to shut down everything that is non-essential to fight or flight. So your digestive system shuts down, your sexual reproduction shuts down, everything shuts down. Long, long, long um, uh, exposure to cortisol then starts to break down the body. So you get irritable bowel syndrome, you get ulcerative colitis, you get thickening of the arteries. Mm -hmm. So the long-term effect of stress, very detrimental to the body. And oh, yeah. ultimately it can develop into significant illnesses. Mm. So the autoimmune uh, type, of uh, type of illnesses, fibromyalgia, ME, What's that? What's the Fibromyalgia is, is kind of muscle, muscle aches, muscle pains, the sheaths that, that coat the nerves. Okay. Um, uh, ME or multiple sclerosis, all of those things come under the banner of autoimmune. So that means there is no chemical or viral reason for it happening external to the body. So you've not got a virus that's caused this. It's not a biological infection that's caused this. This is being created inside your own body as a result of something. Mm -hmm. And now when they track it back, they find it's normally as a result of stress and the long-term effects of cortisol. Did not know that. Yeah. So the, 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 with clinical hypnotherapy, the way that we counteract that and the way that we give people back control <coughs> over their health, both physical and mental health, is to induce the opposite. So we've got the sympathetic nervous system. So it's running for primarily on the, on the SAM axis, which is the sympathetic um, adrenal medullary producing the, the uh, adrenaline in the noradrenaline and the HPA axis, which then drives the cortisol. So that's the hypothalamus working with the pituitary gland, which sends a signal to produce cortisol. Yeah, that's the primary stress system. And when that's running, we're either fighting or we're fleeing. There is another system, which is freeze. And that can come in as well, where the whole system collapses. That's a massive response to shock, isn't it? Why is that a more common response in women than men? Probably emotional. It's probably just, you know, the way that the body is formed and the way that the, the, the impact is so sudden. Now we are predisposed to fight and flee, aren't we? We, we were powered that way. Um, then by nature, it's more about nurture. So it's freeze. What do I need to do next? But in the instance of freeze, the system can collapse. But it is a natural response. It's part of the body's natural defense system. You often see animals defecate when they fly away, don't they? They dump everything and they fly. It's the same, same, same type of system. That The part of the, um, the viscera, the abdomen, abdominal part takes effect but when we bring the relaxation response in which is the opposite of stress so there's also homeostasis in the body the body is constantly trying to stay in balance yeah not too much stress not too much relaxation but balanced when it's out of balance that's when all the problems happen right psychologically physiologically chemically and biologically it should always be in a state of stress it's always a state of stress <coughs> isn't it i mean it, it, it's a Productive stress is great. You know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, actors, uh, musicians, athletes, mm. they need a degree of stress for productivity to just take it to that another level. Um, but then there's always the come down, isn't there? There's always the relaxation and the enjoyment and the satisfaction from having performed. Mm -hmm. But that's not the kind of stress we're talking about when we've got a high state of anxiety constantly running and feelings inside of us that we don't know where they're coming from because we're not in control of them. Mm. Yeah. And so the way that we handle that is to bring into place the, the relaxation response. And this is a wonderful mechanism the body has, which is bringing everything back to balance. When it's out of balance, we're, we're in a world of pain. When we're balanced, everything is okay. And we can look at the world through a different set of eyes. 
And the relaxation response works with the vagus nerve, which is a nerve which, which comes out of the back of the cranium and comes down. It innervates all the muscles of our face for social engagement. It elevates. And innervates. Innervates. So it, sorry, innervates. innervates, yeah. The, so it, the, all the nerves are related to the muscles on the face, um, the heart, the lungs. So everything above the diaphragm um, primarily works on that, that main part of the vagus nerve. And then it goes into the viscera and it covers our spleen, our pancreas and our bowel and liver. And as you know, as I said, stress doesn't live in the head, it lives in the body because those chemical effects ultimately have an effect on an organ somewhere. They're, they're all designed to have an effect, whether it's sexual reproduction, whether it's fight or flight, those chemicals have a response. So they go somewhere in the body and they create an effect somewhere in the body. And so when we bring the relaxation to response in and we bring them down from anxiety, we bring them down from stress into a level of relaxation the natural processes of the body come back into play and balance is achieved. And then all of those toxic chemicals can be expressed through the urine, through our breath. There was some research done in Canada by a, a scientist, Dr. David Suzuki, and he took people in the peak of anger, in the peak of a hatred fueled aggressive outburst, yeah, emotionally driven for whatever reason, <clears throat> captured the breath samples that they were expressing in that period of time. Over an hour, when they analysed the breath samples, there was enough toxicity in there to kill 80 guinea pigs no. instantly. <laughs> yeah. So these chemicals have a toxic effect on our body and we need to get rid of them. We need to purge them somehow. So they come out in our breath. If you do a swab of your mouth, you can test cortisol. You know how much stress you're under. Yeah. Mm. Um, it comes out in urine. It comes out in feces. It comes out. It comes out in sweat. Dogs can smell fear. Ah. So those chemicals that are being ah, produced. Animals, that, animals can smell fear. That's what, ah, so, okay. I, so the chemicals, <laughs> the chemicals inside the body are coming out through the sweat. Because like, we've got to get rid yeah, of them. Of course. Otherwise of course, we become yeah. toxic. Yeah, of course. Why have I never thought of that before? I feel like a bloody idiot. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I had to learn this stuff as well. Yeah, but it's, the, the whole thing is fascinating, Hugh. The whole thing is fascinating. Yeah. And, and so working to bring those balances back is all that I do really with clinical therapy. And, and when we're working with the PTSD, anxiety, stress, depression, whatever it is, it's just getting the balance back. Once we're in balance, everything's fine and we can move forward. And so the thing I love about it is all you're doing is you're giving people back control over part of their life they feel they've lost control over for whatever reason. How do you, um, when you get a patient, how? I call mine, my, my, they're, so they're clients for me. Clients, sorry, pa sorry, patients, sorry. For, patients for a doctor. I apologize, yeah. I apologize. But I have to write to doctors and I have to say, look, with your permission, um, I'd like to work with your patient, Mr. So-and-so, to help them overcome their anxiety, their stress and depression, and thereby reduce the amount of medication they're on. Uh, and they need to phase that reduction. If they're That's, on antidepressants, it needs to be a phase reduction. I was going to ask about about that that medication side of things. Um, I, uh, do you think that? So I I would assume that. Of, no, I, I won't assume it at all. So, so I, I I like I like to think I do think I like that I do think that um, the for doctors who are so doctors should have could have more training in the psychological side of things than just the sort of physiological side of things. And because I think that, um, it, their only, their, one of the, their only real response that they can do apart from refer to a, a clinical hypnotherapist mm. or a psychologist or psychiatrist is their only other way they can assist with is pre prescribed in medicine, which I feel for a psychological issue should be, that should not be on numero, numero uno of the treatments. Absolutely. It should be, um, it should be a, <coughs> you know, well, what's your lifestyle like? How much you drink? Uh, what's your relationships like? Yeah, so it should be bank referral before even any talk about antidepressants is. But on average, I'm you not, get nine minutes with the GP because they're under pressure. Oh, I know. I'm not blaming them at all. Yeah. I'm not blaming them at all. Um, but it's it just because it, the medication side causes too many problems. Yeah. I mean, it, it also frustrates. I went to the, the doc the other day, right? Uh, so seven weeks ago, I cracked the rib. I didn't know I cracked the rib the week before doing jujitsu. I thought, I thought I just torn an intercostal. Mm. Week later, I wasn't getting better. I'd never cracked the rib before either. Flipping heck, the you pain. Know about it, Honest to God, I just bed was a nightmare. Getting yeah. out of bed, uh, epic. Just breathing something. <sighs> breathing wasn't too bad. Was it Coughing was a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Coughing, <laughs> sneezing was a problem. Right. Anyway, I went to the dock. I went to the, in the walk-in center. I, I, uh, where was it? Yeah, walking center because my GP is not here. It's away, and the doctor said to me, uh, "Blah blah blah." Yeah, pretty sure you cracked the rib. Cool. All right, I'm going to prescribe you painkillers. Um, 
you know, just go, go on. I said, I don't want them. Yeah. He said, no, 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 you, you should have them. I said, no, I, it hurts me. Don't get me wrong, but not, I can get by. You know, I've got back, by for a week. I'll get by. And she looked at me like I was mad. You know, I said, no, it's fine. Like, I really think she had pink. I said, is, is, I said, I, I don't want them. I don't need them. Mm. So then she, she got a bit of a cob on, got a bit, got a bit funny. The problem was I'd done this before she'd done the examination. <laughs> right, right. She, uh, she, yeah, she'd, you marked her car. she'd, she'd sort of diagnosed me on it, what I told her information when you got a crap rib. And then she came and did the diagnosis and uh, the, the examination. It was quite painful. I think she'd give me more pain for being, for, for being an obnoxious prick and saying, <laughs> <laughs> honest to God, right? She wasn't Probably, happy yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. She wasn't happy at all. And then it came up again. She said, um, I really want to put painkillers. And I said, look, I don't want it. I said, will it, will it help this? Because you should, surely you should treat the cause and not the symptom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she looked at me and said, no, no, you, you, we treat the symptoms, Mr. Kia. And that's and I, was, I was thinking, no, that, I'm like, you know, you start second guessing yourself. Mm. How, am I getting this wrong? You treat the flipping problem, not, you know, the cause, not the yeah. symptom. And then she said something else about, uh, she said something about cocodamol then, which is an mm-hmm. anti-inflammatory as well. Yeah, yeah. I said, ah, I said, well, that, okay, well, that. Codeine and help, paracetamol. Yeah. yeah I, I said, will that help the, the, the actual, the cause? Will it help the rib? And she went, yes, it will. I said, in that case, that's fine. I understand. I, you know, yeah. I took the prescription. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I walked out. I was annoyed. I was yeah, annoyed yeah, because yeah, it yeah. got. I feel very strongly about it, the medication side of things. And I was annoyed that she'd straight away gone the medication. I've seen yeah. some some absolutely horrendous stories as a result of medication. Not this. Not not agreeing with people. I mean, it's you know when you look at the medication and, and then you probably feel the same way. You look at it and you then you read the side effects. Yeah. Well, I would argue yeah, yeah, they're not yeah. side effects. They're actually direct effects. It's convenient for the pharmaceutical companies to say their side effects and try to make them look less important. But some of them are quite significant when you look at them. You know, Robin Williams, when he committed suicide, his medication he was given as an antidepressant had a predisposition to make someone suicidal. Oh, my God. It increased the elevant, the, the, the elevated rate of suicidal thoughts an as a side effect. An it was, it was listed as a side effect. That's crazy. It had the propensity to make them worse. And, and that's a side effect. Well, it's not. It's a direct effect. Because if you weren't taking the medication, you wouldn't get that effect. It's not the intended effect. The intended effect, the primary intended effect of the medication is to give relief from whatever symptom. Absolutely. Um, but the side effects are direct effects of taking that. They're not the primary effect, but they're still a direct effect. Mm. So I think you're right. And when it comes to mental health, you know, there's a long weaning off period of them and that can be quite painful as well for people. Yeah, yeah. And you're right. You know, let's look, let's treat the cause. Let's understand the cause, but the GP doesn't have time to do that. And the process for referring into the NHS is, you know, it could be 18 months yeah. before someone's seen. I, I, a client that saw me a couple of weeks ago, um, she was told it would be a minimum of eight to 10 weeks before she'd see anybody. Yeah. You know, and, and that's when, when you go to the GPs, when you're feeling absolutely miserable. And you're at your worst, which stimulates you to go. I, I, I yeah, I mean, that, that, sorry, I can come back. That, like, I just want to, uh, yeah, that lifestyle side of things. It's, it's something, one of the, re- this conversation we're having now is one of the reasons I do this podcast because it's, you're having those one of the conversations. I'm realizing things and thinking, you know, everyone, I wish fucking people could hear it. Not because I'm a genius or yeah. you're a genius, but, We've had different, you know, we've had like, everyone's has different experiences, right? But the lifestyle thing is huge. It's one of the reasons I feel so strong about the medication side of things is because I've experienced it myself. I know for a fact, like co- coffee, tea and coffee, mm-hmm. the year before last, year before last, year, uh, recently in the last couple of years, real bad state, right? I, one of my bad periods, right? And, uh, I met someone who was, um, she was a uh, in yoga and all that. She was a bit very fairy. I don't mean that. I don't mean that about yoga people. But she was, you know, she crystals and yeah. like the power of healing and the rock and stuff. It's mad. She's not like that anymore. Um, but she said to me, um, one yeah, one of the things I was drinking, blah 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 blah. She said, "Have you tried cutting out caffeine?" I was like, "I love, I love tea and coffee. I love it." She just try it. I stopped drinking tea and coffee, and I, I drink it now, right? But it's because I've let myself get on the bang wagon, by falling off the wagon, <laughs> falling off the caffeine wagon, right? But at the time, I stopped having tea and coffee. 
I thought you had a cracking headache. I, <laughs> no, no, I didn't. Did not because injury. I didn't. I don't, I'm not addicted. I have loads of it. Yeah. But I stopped drinking it, right? And it's one of those. I thought, well, what this is going to make? Because I'm f- mentally, I, I felt sure. all right at that at that point. That sort of that week I felt fine. Cut out the tea and coffee. Within 24 hours, 24, 48 hours, I my brain, I was in a different mental state. So where I thought I was fine, I went to an, another state again. I thought. I wasn't fine when I thought I was fine. I wasn't fine. Mm. And all I'd done is cut out caffeine. And did you feel better? I, I felt, I felt better. I felt a lot better. Just so like I was drinking peppermint tea, which I love anyway, mm-hmm. but I, I'd never done that before. Mm. So when you talk about, again, that lifestyle, comes, someone comes into the doctor depressed. Instead of the antidepressants, I'm just drinking. Well, I, you yeah, have a couple of pints tonight. Right. Here's what I want you to do. Uh, stop patient. self-medication. Yeah. Stop. I want you to try stopping alcohol for, for 72 hours. It's going to be hard for the first two days. Mm. Okay, because it's habit, and yeah, everyone likes a pint, mm-hmm. and then just see what we see. What and then I'm not, and then we'll you know come back next week. Yeah, the difference between night and day, you know, it just uh, it, it's it just the impact that has those little things have. I've got a friend who um, he suffers from depression, quite bad. Uh, I say quite bad. I think I've never you know I, he he'll he'll be off work for weeks at a time. Um, uh, yeah, I so. But you think, you know, you feel sorry for him. But well, the bloke, the bloke drinks constantly. Well, he's self-medicating constantly. Yeah, you know, it's not helping himself. Yeah, it's not. It's not it's, I'm not that close enough mm. to him to be able to say, "Mate, look, I know it's hideous, and it's night we've had a few weeks off." And and because he, he he speaks to me openly about it, but I'm not close enough to go. Fucking hell, mate, he's smashing it. He's smashing the alcohol yeah. every night. Like, and I talk, he's a big fella as well. Mm. A lot of you know, drinks a lot of booze. You know, it's, it's got to have it. Yeah, cut that out. I'm guaranteed. Guaranteed, your depression will either go away or it sh- improve significantly. Yeah, it can yeah. compound the effect of depression because one of the things, of the, the, the cruel thing about depression is that the brain is so disturbed that, that it robs them of their sleep, their REM sleep. So after about 25 minutes of sleep, when we've fallen asleep, 25 minutes in to 40 minutes in, we go into REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. So if you look at somebody in that state of sleep, you'll see their eyes flicking back and forward under the eyelids. At that time, every muscle in the body that's got anything to do with defying gravity is paralyzed. You, you won't move. In REM sleep, the only thing that's happening is the brain is processing emotion. With depression, you're robbed of that REM sleep. Now, if you... so, well, It's the same for alcohol, isn't it? That's why... You, it, does, you, it has the same effect. Yeah. So if you think about... Um, in this it's sort of torture, sleep deprivation, yeah? You can starve somebody and they can probably live for 30 days. You can not give them water and they'll probably live for a couple of days. You rob them of REM sleep and they'll die within seven days. Really? Yeah. Because if the brain has no capacity, if the brain has no ability to process emotion, to discharge energy and to make space and capacity for the next day that's coming over the horizon towards it, it can't fun- it can't function it can't cope so if you took it to that level it, it, it's brutal and that's what happens in the vicious cycle of depression they 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 don't have any restful restorative sleep they can't process the emotions that are running around inside their head they wake up in the morning even more knackered than when they went to bed and they got another day to face mm. and so it's not surprising they self medicate it doesn't help because, again, it compounds the effect. You know what it's like if you have a skinful, you wake up, you feel even worse in the morning. Well, you add to depression to that, and you can imagine what kind of journey they're on that day. Mm. It is horrendous. But, you know, it's just people believe it makes them feel better, which is placebo, isn't it? You know, they get the little bit of relief from the alcohol. They get the little bit of feel-good factor. But it comes back with a sledgehammer the next morning. Yeah, Jordan, Jordan, Peterson, Jordan Peterson, he, he refers to it as a... Uh and his book, he refers to it as get, you get caught in a uh, the feedback loop, yeah, like is. in the studio. <clears throat> you know, you 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 drink, it's you get drunk, cycle. you wake up in the morning, yeah. you feel like shit, you have a pint, you feel better. But then, as the time goes on, you're in that loop, and it gets worse and worse the and worse and worse and worse. And the worse reward and worse becomes and worse. less. Yeah, yeah and the more reward and more. becomes less. Yeah. yeah, and so you're right. You know, you need to break the cycle. You need to start treating the symptom and get down to the root end of it. You know, get rid of the self medication because alcohol's great, isn't it? Sociably, let's be honest, it's it's great. Yeah. Um, but when it becomes a self medication, it's a different story. Yeah. And there are many different levels. It can be drugs. It can be you know sex. It can be all sorts of things. There's all different ways to medicate. Yeah. But when that behavior is affecting your life it's time to look at it and change it mm. and understand what's driving it and that's the primary bit it's just understanding the drivers when you know what the drivers are you can fix it very simply yeah it's not a difficult thing to do um, but it takes a little bit of 
effort yeah. because you create the habit of thinking. You can change the habit of thinking. You can reframe it. You can re-reference it. And so I talk about with with athletes as well or, or with people that are coming back from, from trauma. It's about, first of all, you know, you've got to rest. You've got to give the body the chance to restore its energy. So you've got to rest. You've got to recuperate. You've got to repair what you need to repair. And then I think it's quite important that you kind of reflect. So think about the journey, think about the experiences and then reference it properly, put it into proper context and then you can recharge and then you can reset your goals and then you can go again. So whether it's a you know great result, you do the same thing. Whether it's a bad result, you do the same thing. And that's the proper way to go about it, I think. Once you've got it done and you've referenced it correctly and you've taken some advice on the areas that you're confused about, it helps. Mm. And we never get taught this stuff. You know, we never get taught how to control our mind. We never get taught how to really look at a situation and, and kind of uh, dissect it and think about the emotions that are driving us and why do I feel that way? We instinctively react. Fear is the fastest human emotion. It's milliseconds. And everything comes after that. Um, and you know all of the emotions that are attached to it that drive our behaviour. That's where we need to start working. Mm. Let's go back to the seed event. What what was the initial cause of the the emotion? Um, and when the trigger gets pulled and you feel that recoil happening for the rest of your life, well, let's go back to the point of pulling the trigger. Then let's have a look at what was it loaded with in the first case. What emotions? What fears? What anxieties were already preloaded? Yeah, and when you. I Sorry. Yeah. I mean that, like what I was saying about the the, the, the like like the lifestyle change. I, I'm not just to clarify. I'm not saying that oh, that'll fix your drama. But when you go along through, as you you have a problem, like you talk about there, childhood childhood issues, PTSD, depression, just a mental, just mental ill health or whatever yeah, that is, yeah. right? Well, as <coughs> as that goes along, and you and you and it, and it gets worse, and you, it gets less treated, you pick up bad things, lot other bad yeah. behaviours, yeah. like the drinking, yeah. like the. Uh, Drugs Com like compensations, like being a wanker. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just being a, not a nice person, and and you, you there need you something needs to the the solution to that is things need to change. You know, so either I mean, if you're like Sometimes, I'm just thinking to myself. Yeah, I'm thinking to myself in the past. I'm I'm almost like I'm talking to myself. You know, right? You feel like you feel like shit. You're not great at the minute. Change something and do that. Either introduce something positive, Hugh, yeah. mm -hmm. like go get up in the morning, go for a ten minute walk, <coughs> or uh, or um, or, or spend you know commit to getting up or coming in the evening, spending five minutes and sitting down with your partner and, and just and having a conversa conversation or your kids, yeah, for example, or get rid of something negative, yeah, bring introduce it something out. positive, get rid of something negative, like uh, try having. A couple of less cans tonight, or try having not drinking at all, yeah. you know, or try, um, or try, uh, some exercise. Yeah, you just introduce something positive, get rid of some, go get rid of something negative because one of those tiny little changes, which is super easy, like I'm not saying get rid of caffeine would work for everyone, it worked for me at that time, I'm drinking again now, but it would work for me at, at that time. But just that little change can get you to a mental to just. Elevate you just slightly enough so you can take the next step. Yeah. Like speak to your friend, absolutely. Speak to your partner. Go to the doctor. Speak to yeah. speak to Andy. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you, know, you, you know it's um. Yeah. I, I get animated process, about it. Isn't it? I get animated process. about it because it's such an easy thing, and I look back and think, oh god, I could have. But done. The simple things are often overlooked. I know, I know. <laughs> because they're so simple, it can't possibly work. I know, I know. I know. You know, and, and they are simple, and I, you know, we've got some simple techniques for when anxiety is really running, you know, you know, when you're feeling tense and you're feeling anxious, you're sometimes not even aware of why you're feeling anxious. You just feel like you're on high alert. And I say, well, there's a simple technique. It's called five, four, three, two, one. Look around you and identify five things that you can see. So you start with your eyes. Look at, just scan the area, take your mind off what you're thinking about and look at five things you can see yeah, and name them loud. Then listen for four things you can hear. Then three things that you can feel two things that you can smell and one thing that you can taste. If you do that, it brings you down from an elevated plane of anxiety. Then you can breathe. And when you breathe, you can start to think slightly differently. And it's a very simple process. I've heard that before. It's I've one of the most that, yeah. simple distraction yeah. techniques yeah. at the height of any kind of anxiety, road rage, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Okay. Just have the mindset. I'm in control. 
And what I say to people is when you start to breathe in, you say these words to yourself. I've got a calm mind. I've got a strong body. I can cope with this. Or flip it the other way. I've got a strong mind and I've got a calm body. I can cope with this. Whichever way works for you. There's no one size fits all. Mm. We're all different. Mm. But there are simple things like that. You said, you know, just take a decision to do something slightly different. And that technique is a really powerful interrupter. And it's a really great distraction technique. And all it's designed to do is bring your focus back down into a narrow area that you can control, which is your breathing, how you breathe. And you've heard the phrase, oh, he's uptight. Yeah, it's because you're only breathing from here, because you're short and sharp and tense with stress. You don't breathe from the diaphragm and you certainly don't breathe from the abdomen. But if you ever look at a baby lying on the bed when they're sleeping and they're relaxed, they breathe from their belly. Mm. Yeah, so if you can get more oxygen in by relaxing and breathing better, you can have a conversation. But you can't rationalise with people that are highly agitated and uh, anxious. No, I mean, and, and the, the that that again, that caffeine thing. Yeah, I, I I accepted that. If you'd said that day, I was feeling okay. You know, generally at that time, I was feeling like crap. If you if I was, it was my bad days, yeah. and you'd said to me, uh, Hugh, uh, if you uh, stop drinking tea and coffee for a, a couple of days, you're going to feel better. I'd be like, you'd have kicked off. Yeah. That, man. For me to uh, accept that. For, for me to accept that was a, a possible, not solution, a possible, something to try. I had to be in that good, that frame of mind, yeah. you know, because this is where it was. I had to come from the right person at the right time sure. in, that, in the right sure. environment. Um, and, it, it, and that's one of the biggest things that we need to do in the clinical hypnotherapy field. First of all, is, is building rapport and trust. And when you earn that respect and that right to have a conversation because you've built rapport and you've built some trust, mm. then you can start to make some impact. But it's, um, it's all about understanding where the person is. I never, ever think, what's wrong with this person? I always think, what's this person been through? What, what have they been through that's affecting the way they're feeling? Mm. What is it that's affecting their emotions and you know, creating this, this behavior that they don't want in their life? Because they normally come because they want to change. They need some support and they need some guidance on how can they ca- take control over these areas. And you're right, it's the simple things. And I often say, you know, let's look at your lifestyle. You know, what is it you're doing right now? Um, and that's that initial how can we improve it now yeah, right now absolutely. not necessarily solve the whole problem what's the quick wins? just make it a little bit easier for you yeah a little bit easier yeah. yeah and relaxation is probably the quickest win they can get mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. let's start wrapping this up mate I have uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed the conversation <laughs> I have Likewise. I have um, is there shameless plug time shameless plug so tell me the name of your practice so my practice is peak personal performance dot co dot uk I'm working on a really exciting project at the moment with a number of clinical hypnotherapists across the whole of the UK. A lot of them are ex-military, um, first responders, uh, police. And we've got a pilot program going to the MOD at the moment to have con- clinical hypnotherapy taken back into the primary response for PTSD. It was used at the end of the First World War in the UK. It was used at the end of the Second World War in the UK. It was used in America at the end of all of their conflicts. In the late 80s, the pharmaceutical companies came (coughs) forward with the pharmaceutical interventions and it fell out of favour. But it is the primary brief, very brief um, therapy for reducing all of those symptoms that we talked about. And all I'd say, Hugh, is if anyone is struggling anywhere in the UK at the moment, with the things that we've been talking about. If they'd like to connect via the show, I can connect them with one of those clinical hypnotherapists in their local area that can support them, Mm. either over the telephone or over the internet, and help them to be able to get control back over that part of their life. Yeah. Well, I know people have benefited from from that kind of therapy, and uh, and obviously you've done it, so I I, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, um, they don't have to go through the show, they can come straight to the website. So peak performance... Peakpersonalperformance.co.uk. There you go. You're all over social, social, social media as well, aren't you? Not as much as I should be. I'll, I'll, I'll be improving the, that. Yeah. <laughs> you can show off the polo shirt, mate. I'll get this off here. Yeah, yeah, uh, thank you for buying one, by the way. No, my pleasure. When the last one gets sold, there's not many left. 1,900 quid will have been raised. What a great, what a great job. Yeah, cool. Well done, buddy. Thank you very much, Andy. My pleasure.